This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. That brings us to the second, the second set of words, the second phrase that Jesus spoke. And he spoke salvation. The second set of words were salvation. The second phrase that Jesus uttered on the cross was about his salvation. It was, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is another word for heaven. And we find it in Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 42, or excuse me, verse 39. One of the criminals who were, who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? What he was saying was, Bro, look what's happening. You're going to die too. Aren't you kind of afraid of the fact that you're about to die? You're going to, you're going to meet God? And verse 41 says, and we, and this is the, the, that thief that was responding says, and we indeed justly, we deserve to die. We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, someday I'd like to preach a sermon called The First Man Saved. Because that was the man on the cross. You think about it. The first man literally saved on earth was the thief on the cross. He was the first man to receive the forgiveness of Jesus, to apply the blood of Christ in his life, and to be born again, a thief. Because as far as we know, and, and uh, this man who repented and was saved by Jesus, received his salvation as an act on the cross. He was dying, the dying man. There's so much powerful truth in this exchange between the thief and the Savior. And I want us to take a few moments and look at this. We're taught much about this transformation in the words of the thief himself. He was obviously a soul lost in the way of the world. Uh, he was a thief apparently more than a petty thief, uh, a thief whose crime would subject him to death by capital punishment. The word that's used for thief could also be uh, translated as an insurrectionist or a, a rebel. It's possible. But um, uh, in, in any case, there was something that he did that deserved capital punishment by death. And not just death by capital punishment, but a death that would serve as a warning to others. That's why they hung him on the cross, and that's why the crosses were by the main thoroughfares that led in and out of Jerusalem. And so Jesus and these two thieves were hanging on crosses that were by, were basically at the Grandview Triangle. You know, I mean, that's really the way it was. It was just so much traffic, so many people would see this. And so it would serve as a warning to all. And in his rebellion and sinful lifestyle, he continued his arrogance and disregard for God's ways by mocking the Messiah. This man who had such a brutal, vicious lifestyle continued that even on the cross, knowing he was about to die. And he started his mocking of Jesus until he began to notice what was going on. At some point, he began to notice that something was different with Jesus. Something happened that captured him. I believe it was the words of Jesus when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine a thief hanging on the cross, knowing that he's about to step in and, and face God and face the judgment, recognizing that, that, that this was it for him, hanging on the cross, looking back at his life, knowing the kind of life, realizing that he deserved to be up there, he was guilty. He was dying by capital death by, pun by or capital punishment by death. Hearing these words, Father, forgive him for he doesn't know what he did. He doesn't know what he's done. Wow. Not a statement, not a statement, Father, get him off the cross because he didn't know what he was doing. 
It wasn't, Father, condemn all of those people that put Him on the cross because He doesn't know what He did. It was simply, Father, forgive Him for He doesn't know what He's done. And in those simple words, something happened, I believe, in that thief's life where he recognized, I am going to face the Father, and the Father can forgive me. Because I am guilty of what I've done. But now I'm beginning to see, I did it for the wrong reasons. There was so much more. So much more. I remember leading an an older man to Christ uh, one time. He was, he was probably just, actually he died within a year of, the, of coming to know the Lord. And his words after he received Christ was, if I'd only known. There's something about coming to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ when you recognize that life has value, purpose, meaning, focus, and destiny. That it's not just about being in the here and now and living your life in any fashion that you want to and getting away with it but that God is up to something in your life now because he wants to be something up in, uh, he wants to be up to something in your life for eternity that recognition brings something to you when you recognize if i had only known i wouldn't have waited this long i wouldn't have waited this long to build a relationship with god something happened to that thief that captured him and i believe it was in those words father forgive him for he knows not what he does And in that moment, as he pondered the reality of life and the reality of the life of this Jesus on the cross, looking at the difference between the two, his life and the life of Jesus, he knew about the life of Jesus, and looking at his life and comparing the two, and it began to dawn on him, and he says this to the other thief, he says, we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Salvation comes when a man realizes that he is a sinner, deserving the reward of his sin. Salvation comes when a man realizes that he is a sinner, deserving the reward of his sin. And there is a sense of the reality of eternal doom without a right relationship with God. Romans 3.23 says it this way, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin keeps you from the glory of God. Sin separates you from the glory of God. And the word glory literally means the presence. It's the glory, is the way to, to define glory is the revealed presence of God. Sin separates you from the revealed presence of God. Most of us know that verse, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we miss the context in which it is written. We're, I, we're having problems with our, with our screen, but I, I want you to listen and catch this. This is the context of Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 through 25 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that means payment, propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That says, you have sinned and you fall short of the glory of God, but I'm offering you a gift, which is called redemption. In other words, paying the price for your sin. Something about Christ's life touched that thief's heart, and he recognized for the first time that Jesus was who he said he was. And he calls out to Jesus these simple words. Remember me. That's it. Remember me. Now notice the humbleness of that plea. There was no, I deserve to go to heaven. There was no, how about a break? There was no, yeah, I did, I did some bad things, but you know, I, I did some good things also. In fact, he wasn't even asking to go to heaven. Did you catch that? He wasn't even asking to go to heaven. He knew he didn't deserve it. He simply asked 
God to remember him. Jesus understood that heart cry. Jesus understood that heart cry. The thief never said words like, forgive my sin, or I receive you as my Lord, or I want to be saved. He simply, as best he understood with a penitent heart, called out to God, remember me. One of my favorite, and you'll forgive me for saying this, I'm saying this, and you'll understand the context in which I'm saying this, and I don't mean to be offensive by this, but you'll understand the holiness of this moment. When I led a, a young man to Christ, it wasn't a young man, he was in his 20s, so I guess he's still a young man, but you know, not a, not a youth. A guy in his youth, and, and he had really led a pretty rebellious life. He'd been in jail, and you know, was, his life was a mess. And he came to know the Lord. And I remember leading him and discussing these things with him and asking him if he wanted to receive Christ and receive the forgiveness of God and invite Christ to come in and become the Lord of his life and change his life. He didn't even answer me. We were sitting at a, at a picnic table. He put his head down on the picnic table and he just started sobbing and he said, what the hell have I done? That's like saying, remember me. We get so caught up in words and get so caught up in form and get so caught up in the formula of how you get saved and you know how you come to know God and we miss the whole point. I want you to see something really important here. When we judge people's salvation experience by what they say or whether or not they act like we think a Christian should act or whether they have met the criteria for our personal doctrine of how a person gets saved, we limit ourselves from seeing God's work. The first man to get saved didn't say, I want to get saved. The first man to get saved didn't say, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The first man to get saved didn't even say he wanted to go to heaven. Salvation comes not by saying the right words or acting the right way or having an emotional experience or even a physical experience. Salvation comes, listen to this, salvation comes not by what you say, but when Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. You get that? Salvation for that man came not because he said, remember me, or I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but because Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. Salvation is not based on what you do, say, act, or behave. Salvation is based on what Jesus does and says in your life. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Club,